Hey there, welcome. In today's lesson, we're going to be looking at some advanced vocabulary on the topic of upbringing and family life. And in fact, the first word we're going to look at is upbringing. So that's a countable noun that means the way you are treated and educated when you are young, especially by your parents. Now we can use the word upbringing in the speaking and writing part of the test. Now be careful about the pronunciation. It's upbringing. So the stress is on the first syllable, upbringing. Try and say it yourself, upbringing. Okay, here's an example sentence. Psychologists are still exploring the ways that our upbringing affects what kind of adults we become. She had a strict upbringing. Try and repeat that after me. She had a strict upbringing. Okay, do you see strict upbringing? That's what's called a collocation. Collocations are words that typically go together and they help you to get a higher score in the IELTS test. So strict upbringing is a very common collocation, but there are more. We can say things like a difficult upbringing, a harsh upbringing, a relaxed upbringing, a loving upbringing. So upbringing is very useful in the IELTS test because we can also combine it with different adjectives to make more advanced vocabulary. Now you might even get asked a question in the speaking test like this. Who has a more significant influence on a child's upbringing, parents or teachers? So this would be considered quite a difficult part three question in the IELTS test. Here's how I would answer. Tricky question. I'd have to say in most cases, the parents. I'm sure there are certain circumstances where teachers will have a larger influence on children's development, but I imagine most of the time it'll be the parents who have a greater influence on how their children turn out. Children learn a lot of their behaviour from their parents, especially in their early years, and pick up a lot of mannerisms that their parents have, such as how to deal with stress and how to treat other people. Not to mention that there'll be genetic characteristics that are passed down. Okay, so let's look at my answer in a bit more detail. I start with tricky question. Now, I often see a lot of students that say, that's a tricky question, or that's an interesting question. And it just sounds a little bit unnatural. To make it sound more natural, just get rid of that sir and say, hmm, tricky question, or hmm, interesting question. It sounds a lot more natural if you don't say that's a, and you just say tricky question, and then you begin to answer. So I say tricky question, I'd have to say. So this is a way of introducing my opinion. I'd have to say in most cases. Now this is a strategy called hedging. You're not saying that it's always the case, but you're saying in most cases. Now this is something that a lot of advanced students do naturally. They don't say always, they say most often, or most of the time, or in most cases. See if you can practice this before your speaking test. And in fact, look, I do it again, most of the time. I'm not saying always, or I'm not just saying it'll be parents, I'm saying most of the time it'll be parents. Okay, I've also got this, turn out. So turn out is a phrasal verb which counts as idiomatic vocabulary and it can help you to get a higher score for lexical resource. So it means, uh, it says on how their children turn out. So turn out here means um, how they become, how they develop, um, how they are at the end of their childhood. So turn out. I've also got this phrase early years, which means when they are young, another phrasal verb, pick up. So you can pick up characteristics or pick up habits from other people, which means that you see those characteristics or those habits and you copy them. So you pick up characteristics or in this case, pick up mannerisms from your parents. I've also got this collocation, deal with stress, which means um, how to overcome stress deal with stress, a very useful collocation, especially if you're getting ready for the IELTS exam, you need to deal with stress. I also have genetic characteristics, which is advanced vocabulary to say how um, our genes and our DNA and everything inside us affects 
who we are, how we act, and what we're like. So genetic characteristics that are passed down. Okay, another phrase or verb. If something is passed down, it means it comes from our parents and then it comes to us afterwards. So for example, my red hair was passed down from my grandfather to my mother and then from my mother to me. Right. Here's a question that you can answer in your own time just to help you practice this vocabulary. What factors in a child's upbringing can determine the kind of person they become? Okay, so a part three question, the kind of question that you might get asked at the end of the speaking test um, when the examiner really wants to test you and see how good your level is. The next word is inherit. So inherit traits, inherit characteristics. This is a verb and to inherit a particular characteristic means to receive them from your parents through genes. So for example, um, this daughter below me has inherited her mum's love of cooking. So she's inherited her mum's love of cooking. Now we can use this phrase in the speaking test, we can use it in the writing test, and it's pronounced inherit. So the stress is on the second syllable, inherit. I inherited my love of music from my father. I inherited my love of music from my father. I inherited my red hair from my mother. Okay, so we can inherit characteristics, we can inherit traits as well. So traits are like mannerisms, behavior. We've also got an adjective form and then there's also another verb, uh, or rather another meaning of the verb, which means to receive money or property, especially when someone dies. So for example, if your uncle dies, or so, sorry, if your parents die, then you might inherit their house. So for example, here's this sentence, she inherited a fortune from her mother. Her mother was very rich. When she died, her daughter inherited a fortune. So inherit characteristics, but we can also inherit money, property, things like that. Now you could get asked a question in, this, in the IELTS test like this. Are you more similar to your mother or your father? Okay, so this is a part one question. I'd say I'm a pretty even mix of both. I certainly inherited my dad's love of music. My dad could spend all day listening to music and I'm exactly the same. However, physically, I'd say that I'm a lot more similar to my mum. I look quite a lot like my mum. We've got the same nose and complexion and our hair colour is similar. Okay, so I start with I'd say. That's I would say, a good way to introduce our opinion. And then I've got this phrase, I certainly inherited my dad's love for music, which means my dad loved music and I also love music. I've inherited his love for music. Okay, and then I say, however, physically. So physically means in relation to my appearance. Physically, I'd say that I'm a lot more similar to my mum. So I'm like my dad in that I love music. I'm like my mum in terms of my appearance. I look quite a lot like my mum. We've got the same nose and complexion. So the complexion is the colour of your skin. So for example, my mum and I are rather pale. We've got quite um, white skin and the same hair as well. Okay, you could get asked a question like this. What characteristics or qualities can people inherit from their parents? Okay, a difficult part three question. The next word is environmental factors. So this is the aspects of your upbringing that determine who you become. Now we can use this in the speaking and also the writing test. Now be careful with the pronunciation. It's environmental factors. Environmental factors. Environmental factors. As well as inherent characteristics, environmental factors play a large role in determining children's lives. Okay, so you can see just like this family, the parents love sport and so because of environmental factors, because these children have grown up in a house full of sport, they might also be interested in sport. So you could get asked a question like this. What environmental factors can affect the way that we develop? 
Here's how I would answer. Well, I guess there's a few different factors. Firstly, I'd say who we spend the majority of our time with has a huge effect on the type of people we become. I've often heard that we're basically a combination of the five people that we spend the most time with, so it's good to choose your friends wisely. Secondly, the wealth of your family probably has a fairly large effect on the type of person you become. Whether you were born into a rich or poor family might affect the type of school you go to, whether you are able to travel when you were young, and the kind of activities you do when you're a kid. Okay, so I start with this. Well, I guess there's a few different factors, and then I say firstly and secondly. Now, doing this can help you to score very well for fluency and coherence, and you would do this typically in part three of the speaking test. You have an introductory phrase where you say, there's a few different factors, and then you organize your ideas with different discourse markers. So you say, firstly, da-da-da-da, secondly, da-da-da-da, in addition, da-da-da-da. A bit like when you're writing an essay, we can use this same kind of strategy when we're giving longer answers in part three. Okay, I've got this phrase fairly large, so fairly is the adverb and then large. Um, sorry, um, fairly is the adjective and large is the noun, so when we use adjectives and nouns together, like fairly large, instead of just saying large, then we're going to get a higher score. And we've also got this word might, so family might affect. Again, this is an example of hedging. I'm not saying it will affect, I'm saying it might affect. So we often use modal verbs like may, might, could, to um, make what we're saying less certain, less sure. This is hedging and it can help us to get a higher score in our speaking. Okay, do environmental or genetic factors have a larger influence on how people behave? A very difficult part three question. You could get asked this though, so um, pause the video and see how you would answer this question. The next word is cultural norms, which is a countable noun that means the shared expectations and rules that guide the behaviour of people in social groups. So for example, below you can see a Japanese businessman bowing to another Japanese businessman. So you probably wouldn't see this between two businessmen in the UK, but perhaps in Japan this is a cultural norm. So we can use this in the speaking test, we can use it in the writing test, and the pronunciation is cultural norms. So cultural norms. When young people travel abroad, they need to get used to a new set of cultural norms and values. Okay, how can people learn about the cultural norms of a country when they are planning to visit? This question gets asked a lot in part three of the speaking test. Here's how I would answer. Well, one of the most straightforward ways is to read a travel guide. You can learn all sorts of useful information from travel guides such as the customs and traditions and how to behave in a polite and considerate way in a foreign country. Apart from travel guides, I suppose we can watch YouTube videos or speak to people we know who have been to the country that we're planning to travel to. Okay, so one of the most straightforward ways is so that's a good way to introduce your first idea. One of the most straightforward ways is. So straightforward means easy or simple. We can also say all sorts of. So you can learn all sorts of useful information. This is basically a synonym for saying lots of different information. All sorts of useful information. You could use this phrase with, um, with other things as well like I'm interested in all sorts of sports, which means lots of different sports. Or, um, I love cooking, I like to make all sorts of food, which means lots of different types of food. Apart from travel guides, okay, so this is a good way of introducing a new idea. I've mentioned travel guides and I say, hmm, apart from travel guides, and then I introduce my next idea and I use this word, I suppose, which is a synonym for I think. I suppose and then I introduce my next idea. Okay, what are some cultural norms that exist in your country? So this is a part one question. Here's a part three question. 
is it important for people to respect the cultural norms of the countries they visit? So you'd likely are say, well, yes, I think it's very important. And the examiner will say, why? And they'll ask you to elaborate. Okay, the next word is out of touch. A bit like this grandma below me, she's out of touch. She's trying to be cool, but she's out of touch. So the opposite of this would be be in touch. And it, out of touch basically means when you're not informed or you don't have the same ideas as most people about something. So we could use this in the speaking test. We can use it in the writing test. And the pronunciation is out of touch, out of touch. So we don't really pronounce that v very much. Out of touch, out of touch. Okay, out of touch. The V or the F that sounds a bit like a V is very quiet. Out of touch. Older parents tend to be out of touch with their children. Sorry, older parents tend to be out of touch with what their children are interested in. So out of touch with something or someone. Do you think that do you think the older people in your country are out of touch with how the younger generation think? Okay, and so often in the IELTS speaking test, you get asked these generalized questions that um, you don't really want to say yes, you don't really want to say no. Here's how I would answer so that I can do that. Well, I wouldn't want to make such a large generalization. I guess there are some older people with similar views to younger people on certain issues and others with very different views. I wouldn't even really want to say that all young people, all old people have the same ideas. I think there are certain young people with particular ideas and other people with other ideas, likewise with older people. I don't think we can generalize like that. Okay, so I use this phrase, well, I wouldn't want to make such a large generalization. Now, this is a very useful phrase for part three of the speaking test. If you've ever done the IELTS test, you know that sometimes you get asked these slightly awkward questions, things like, um, are girls smarter than boys? Um, do boys and girls like the same toys? You can use a phrase like this. Well, I wouldn't want to make such a large generalization. Because what you're doing when you say this is you're acknowledging that this is a generalization, it's a stereotype, it's something that's sometimes true, but not always true. Well, I wouldn't want to make such a large generalization. And then the next um, verb is very useful. I say, I guess. So I'm saying, I wouldn't want to make such a generalization, but here's my answer. I guess. Da -da 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 -da. Again, I end with, I don't think we can generalize like that. Okay. Do you think politicians are out of touch with how the people in your country really feel? So this is a kind of very difficult part three question that you could get asked. Now you might get a question like this in the writing test. In some countries, differences in age between parents and their children is larger than it was in the past. Do you think the advantages of this development outweigh the disadvantages? Now you could use a phrase like out of touch. You could say, well, if there's a larger gap between parents and children's age, parents might be out of touch with how their children feel or think at a particular time of their life because there's a larger age gap. The next word is generation gap. So you can see the grandmother, you can see the granddaughter. There's a generation gap. Now we often use this to signify a lack of understanding. So a lack of, um, or different thoughts between older and younger people. This is often resulting from life experiences. So we can use this in the speaking test, we can use it in the writing test as well. Generation gap. Generation gap. The generation gap is smaller between children and younger parents, which means it's easier for them to relate to one another. So this is actually a sentence that a student used when they were answering the task two question that I just showed you about having older parents and younger parents. And I thought, brilliant sentence. And that, that student actually went on to get band eight in the IELTS writing test. So this is one of their sentences that they used in one of their practice essays. Collocations, we can say bridge the generation gap, which means um, to make the generation gap smaller. 
Okay, is there a large generation gap between the old and young in your country? I wouldn't say that there's an especially large generation gap in the UK. I used to live in China and I'd say that there seems to be a much bigger difference between how the old and young think there compared to the UK. I guess there are certain things that divide the old and young in the UK. One example is the monarchy. Apparently the monarchy is a lot more popular with older people compared to the younger generations. Okay. So ooh, I start with <clears throat> I start with I wouldn't say that there's an especially large generation gap. Okay. I wouldn't say that there's an especially large. So this is a very useful phrase. Um, is there a big difference between boys and girls? I wouldn't say there's an especially large difference between boys and girls. Um, are there, is there a big difference between domestic and international students? I wouldn't say that there's a, an especially large difference between international students and domestic students. So I wouldn't say that there's an especially and then the phrase. I used to live in China, which means in the past I lived in China, now I don't. I'd say, which is I would say, very useful for the speaking test, seemed to. So again, an example of hedging. You're not saying, yes, there's a bigger difference in China. You're saying there seemed to be a bigger difference in China. A subtle difference, but the kind of difference that the examiner um, thinks is important and will reward you with a higher score for. I guess, so a synonym for I think. Now, if any of you are wondering what is monarchy? Well, monarchy is a system of having a king or a queen in your country, just like in the United Kingdom. Do older people and young people spend their time in the same way? Do old people and young people have the same ideas? These are questions that you can practice at home to use the phrase generation gap. Okay, innate. So innate characteristics, this is an adjective. It describes a quality that we are born with or a quality that is naturally present in us, an innate quality. Now we can use this in the speaking test, we can use this in the writing test, and the pronunciation is innate, innate. Some children seem to have an innate ability to do well in school, which means they naturally do well in school. They're born with it. My brother was born with an, an innate ability to get on with people. And this child below me seems to have an innate ability to do ch or to play chess very well. So innate ability, innate sense, innate capacity, innate characteristic. Okay, do you think intelligence is innate <clears throat> or determined by environmental factors? Here's how I would answer. I really wouldn't know. I guess there are certain people who are born with a predisposition to learn at a faster rate or to, or to be able to understand more complex topics. However, I wouldn't say that it comes, that it only comes down to genetics. Environmental factors such as parenting style, nutrition, and access to learning resources will certainly have a role to play as well. Okay. Now, I want to point out this. I really wouldn't know. In the IELTS speaking test, you're often asked questions that you don't know. You've never considered the question before. And I have no authority to say whether innate or environmental factors have a larger role to play with uh, children's upbringing. And I can say that in the test. I'll say, I really wouldn't know. But then what I do next is important. I have a go at answering the question anyway. So I really wouldn't know. Let me have a go at answering the question. Now I've got this uh, word predisposition. Uh, so I'm, the phrase is, I guess there are certainly people who are born with the predisposition to learn at a faster rate. So that means they've got this characteristic. Um, they've already got um, the conditions inside them to be able to learn at a faster rate or understand more complex topics. I've also got a phrasal verb, comes down. So, however, I wouldn't say that it only comes down to genetics. So, that's saying this is not the only factor. It's not only about genetics. There are other things that are important as well. There are other things that 
have a role to play. So have a role to play means that they are also important factors. To have a role to play. Okay, do you think some children are innately more intelligent than others? Okay, so this is the exact kind of question where you could say, I wouldn't really know. And then you give your answer anyway. That's the important thing. The next phrase is raise children. So a verb that means to take care of children until they're completely grown. Now we can use this in the speaking test. We can use it in the writing test as well. Raise children. Parents in different countries often have very different methods of raising their children. So we can say raise children. We could also say raise a family or raise someone, like raise our son, raise my daughter. Why can it, why can it be difficult to raise children and focus on a career at the same time? Well, because both pushing a career forward and raising children require a lot of time and energy. My sister's recently had a child and it's immense how much of her time parenting takes up. She's constantly having to change her plans to accommodate her child's needs and a lot of her mental bandwidth is taken up caring for her kid. I'd say, unless you have a lot of help, it's almost impossible to de dedicate a lot of energy to your career and raising a family or a newly born child at the same time. Okay, so time and energy. This is a binomial. It's um, a word um, like apples and pears. Words that often come together, up and ups and downs, time and energy. So you can use that um, in your speaking test. You can say children take up a lot of time and energy, time and energy. In fact, children take up a lot of time and energy. That's the next word I want to show you, a phrasal verb, to take up time and energy. So here it's take up time, which means um, requires or uses a lot of time. Or you could say take up a lot of energy, which means uses a lot of energy. We've also got this phrase, mental bandwidth. So a computer has bandwidth. It's the ability um, to, for example, download a lot from the internet or to operate very quickly. So I'm using this in a metaphorical sense to say um, you need a lot of mental bandwidth. So the ability to, um, to spend a lot of time thinking and um, to, to be able to think quickly. And if you have children, especially if they're very demanding children, you don't have so much mental bandwidth because your all of your thoughts and all of your thinking is absorbed with the child. We've also got, again, that phrasal verb, taken up. So we can take up energy, we can take up time, we can take up mental bandwidth. Of course, take up means to use. Okay. Do you think it's important to be wealthy to raise children? Okay, next question. Spoil children. So this is a verb. This child below me is spoilt. She's looking very bored despite all of these presents being given to her on her birthday. So to spoil someone means to treat someone too well, especially by being too generous. We can use it in the speaking test and the writing test. And the pronunciation is spoil children. Spoil children. Spoiling children can have a knock-on effect later in their lives. So spoil children, or we can just say spoil someone. I spoil my girlfriend. I spoil my boyfriend. My parents spoil me. I think he's a nice guy, but he spoils his children. We've also got the adjective form, spoilt. Spoiled children tend to be demanding and needy. Now, you might get asked a question like this. Do you think it's good to spoil children? So a typical part three question. I'd say, no, certainly not. I don't think it's a good idea to deprive a child, but it's certainly not a good idea to spoil a child either. It's all about finding a balance. Okay, so no, certainly not. You'll notice that often the first sentence of my answer is very short. Things like, no, certainly not. That's very typical. 
often in the speaking test, we give a short answer or a short response and then we elaborate. So I say, no, certainly not. And then I elaborate on why not. In this case, I say, I don't think it's a good idea to deprive a child. So deprive means um, you don't give a child the things that they need. If you deprive a child, they don't get presents on their birthday, they don't get more food if they ask for it, you're depriving a child. So I say, it's not a good idea to deprive a child, but it's not a good idea to spoil them either. It's about finding a balance. Okay, here's a question that appeared in the IELTS writing test recently. Some parents give their children everything that they ask for and allow them to do what they want. Is this good for children? What could be the consequences for these children when they grow up? Okay, so obviously we're talking about spoiling children. And you can say that. You can say, well, I don't think it's a good idea to spoil children. Now, in this case, it says, the, the question says, um, give children everything that they ask for. And you're, you're using the word spoil. These are paraphrase, they're synonym phrases. And that's going to show the examiner that you've understood what the idea of this um, question is and that you can use synonyms correctly. High score in IELTS writing. Okay, learned behavior is the next phrase. The behavior and characteristics that we learn as a result of experience. Now, you might be thinking, what on earth is, does this dog below have to do with learned behavior? Um, and the reason I've put this image is, have you ever heard of the experiment um, or the study um, Pavlov's dogs experiment, I think it's called? And basically what they did is um, the scientists would ring a bell and then give the dog a treat. And then next week or the next day, they would ring the bell and they'd give the dog a treat. And then this continued for a long period of time until one day they rang the bell and they didn't give a dog a treat. And then they watched the dog start to salivate. So a lot of saliva. The dog was clearly very hungry. And that's because the dog had um, learned the behavior that when they hear the, this bell, they're used to getting a treat, a snack, something to eat. So that is learned behavior. We can use this in the speaking, the writing test, pronunciation, learned behavior. And we, here's an example sentence. Learned behavior from teachers can have a large impact on the way children develop. Okay, what learned behavior did you develop from school? I'd say I developed the ability to organize my time well. I had a lot of classes and a lot of homework. On top of that, I wanted to spend most evenings skateboarding with my friends, and I think that helped me to learn how to organize my time well. If I wanted to go skateboarding, I had, I had to have done all of my homework first. Okay, on top of that is the phrase I want to show you here. It means in addition. So I had a lot of homework and classes. On top of that, I wanted to go skateboarding. So on top of that means in addition or additionally. Okay. Once children start school, teachers have more influence on their intellectual and social development than their parents. To what extent do you agree or disagree? So in this essay, you can talk about learned behavior from the parents or learned behavior from teachers. Peer influence. So this is an adjective that means the influence that people of the same age or social position have on each other. So a peer is, for example, your colleagues or the people that you study with or members of the same social class as you. Now we can use this in the speaking and the writing test. Pronunciation, peer influence. So influence. The word influence has the stress at the beginning. Influence. Peer influence has a large impact on a student's ability to perform at school. So we can talk about peer influence. We can also talk about peer pressure. So peer is a noun, a countable noun. And here's an example sentence. Children are more influenced by their peers than their teachers. Okay. Which do you think has played a greater role in your development, parental or peer influence? So this would be considered a very difficult part one question. Here's how I would answer. 
Hmm, difficult to say. I think it has varied at different phases of my life. When I was a kid, I'd say that I was more influenced by my parents. I learned a lot of my mannerisms from my parents, and they played a large role in my development. However, I'd say I was more influenced by my friends during my teenage years. That's probably pretty common. During our teenage years, we tend to spend much more time with our friends, and we often emulate the way our friends dress and behave. Okay, let me show you some features of this answer. I say, hmm, difficult to say. Okay, so again, I say difficult to say. I don't say that is difficult to say or that's difficult to say. Remember earlier on in this lesson, I said instead of saying that's an interesting question or that's a tricky question or that's difficult to say, we just say the last part, tricky question, interesting question, difficult to say. And then we go on to give our answer. So that sounds more natural. I think it has varied at different phases of my life. So different phases mean stages of my life. So um, childhood is one phase of your life. Adolescence, your teenage years, is another phase of your life. Adulthood is a phase of your life. Retirement is a phase of your life. We've got this phrase tend to, which we came across earlier. It's a way to hedge our answers. Very good. And we've also got this word emulate. So emulate means to copy. So if you emulate someone's behavior, you copy their behavior. Once children start school, teachers and other students have more influence on their intellectual and social development than parents. To what extent do you agree or disagree? Okay. So a typical question in the writing test. The next word is infancy. Okay, a bit like this baby before. It's the time when someone is a baby or a very young child. We can use it in the speaking test and the writing test as well. And the pronunciation is infancy. Infancy. Many parents spoil their children during their infancy. So during infancy or in infancy. And we also have the noun or the adjective. Infant. Many parents treat their adolescent children like infants. So adolescent children means teenage children and some people treat their adolescent children like infants means some people treat their teenagers like babies. Okay. What difficulties are there when raising children during their infancy? Wow, a never-ending list. There's all sorts of difficulties with infants. They're constantly getting sick, falling over, getting hungry and crying without the ability to communicate why they're upset. I've got a huge amount of respect for parents of newborns. Okay, I just want to point out this word newborn. So it basically means a baby that is newly born. A newborn. Simple. Um, so yes, newly born baby, a newborn. Let's move on. More and more parents today are allowing their children to play on a computer or tablet because they think children need good technology skills. Do you think the advantages of this development outweigh the disadvantages? So this was a question that appeared in the writing test recently and you can use the word infancy. You can talk about how children or parents want their children to get used to technology during their infancy. So when they're children, when they're babies. Adolescence is the next word. So an uncountable noun that describes the time in a person's life when they're developing into adults. Typically um, 13 to 18, 19 years old. We can use it in the speaking test, we can use it in the writing test as well. Now, pronunciation, adolescence. Adolescence. Adolescence can be a stressful time for young people. Some collocations, early adolescence, during adolescence, and then we've got the noun, the adjective form, adolescent. Many parents treat their adolescent children like infants. We saw that sentence earlier when we were talking about infants. Now, um, with the word adolescence, just be careful that you spell it correctly. I often see students trying to use this word in their writing test, but sometimes they spell it incorrectly. So just um, cover the screen and make sure that you can 
spell this word correctly. A-D-O-L-E-S-C-E-N-C-E. -E in your country, what age are young people considered to have finished adolescence and have become adults? Okay, so this is the kind of question that you could get in part three. Here's how I would answer. 18. In the UK, at 18, you're allowed to drink alcohol, drive a car, get married without your parents' consent, vote as well. People usually make a big deal of their 18th birthday as it signifies when they become an adult. Okay, make a big deal of something. So uh, if you make a big deal of something, it means you show that it is important or important to you at least. Some people make a big deal of their 18th birthday. It's, they show that it's important and they want to have a big party, perhaps with inviting lots of people, maybe a DJ, maybe a huge banquet where lots of people eat. Some people in America that are very rich might even in, invite Snoop Dogg to sing at their 18th birthday. Well, in fact, I think it's the 16th birthday that's very important in the United States. Anyway, they make a big deal of their birthday. We've also got signifies. So it means um, if something signifies something else, it means it shows that something else has happened. So um, your 18th birthday signifies that you have become an adult. It shows that you have become an adult. It's, it's like signifies come from the word signal. What can be difficult about going through adolescence? I don't know if you'd really get asked this question, but um, it's just the exam an example of the kind of question that you could get in part three of the speaking test. The next word is mature. So a verb that means to become more developed mentally and emotionally. A bit like this little mature guy just below me. Now we can use it in the speaking test. We can also use it in the writing test. And the pronunciation is mature, mature. Spoiled children will take longer to mature. Now we've also got the adjective forms. Mature children often prefer to socialize with adults rather than their peers. Now, do you remember peers from earlier in this lesson? Peers are people in the same class, in the same year at school, in the same subject, in the same social class as well. That is what peers are. So if a child prefers to socialize or doesn't like to socialize with their peers, it means they don't like spending time with other children. They prefer to spend time with adults. The opposite would be immature. That's the adjective form. Do you think girls mature at a faster rate than boys do? From my experience at high school, I'd say they do. Especially when I was around 13, the girls in my class seemed a lot more sensible and aware of the world. And I felt like many of my immediate male friends just enjoyed clowning around. I might have just been in an immature group, but it certainly seemed that way. Okay, now um, I want to point out this question. Do you think girls mature at a faster rate than boys do? This is the kind of awkward question that you get in um, part three of the speaking test. And what I do is I talk about my experience. I say, from my experience. Um, and that way I don't have to make a big generalization about boys and a big generalization about girls. I can just talk about what I've seen. And I'll use this phrase, from my experience. Okay, I've also got immediate male friends. So I felt like many of my immediate male friends, which means um, the male friends I was closest to. Immediate friends means uh, your closest friends. I've also got this phrase, clowning around. So you know a clown is uh, the entertainer with the big red nose, sometimes very white skin and face paint, and they typically make you laugh. Well, clowning around is a phrasal verb that means to be silly, to not take yourself seriously, to uh, mess around. So my friends and I used to clown around in class. We were very immature. Okay, and we've got this phrase immature, which I said is the opposite of mature. Um, remember, it's immature and not immature. Okay, so I am, not I am. 
Why do some children mature more quickly than others? A tricky part three question. The next word is gene, a part of the DNA in a cell that controls the physical development behavior of an individual and is passed down or passed on from their parents. So we can use this in the speaking and the writing test. The pronunciation, gene, gene, one syllable, very easy. Our personalities result from a complex interplay between our genes and our environment. So a sentence like this would score very well in the speaking, in the writing test. Here are some collocations. I'm not going to read them out because there's so many. Here's a noun form and here's an adjective form. You can see I'm starting to get a little bit more lazy as we go through this lesson. Remember, you can always pause this video and read, or you can just download the PDF that I'll put below this lesson. Do you think gene editing will become more common in the future? I really wouldn't know. I imagine that it will. As far as I know, gene editing is already used quite regularly in agriculture and also to treat genetic disorders. Perhaps as the technology develops, it will become more common and be used in more cases. I've heard of a company called CRISPR, which I believe is gene editing is a gene editing company, but I don't really know the full extent of what it does. Okay, I've got this phrase, I really wouldn't know. I imagine that it will. Repeat that after me. I really wouldn't know. I imagine that it will. Okay, do you hear that? I imagine that it will. So this is a good phrase again for those tricky part three questions. I really wouldn't know. I imagine that it will. Um, here you're acknowledging that it's a difficult question and you don't really know the answer. But the important thing is you don't just say, I don't know, and then wait for the next question. The important thing is you have a go answering the question. Now I've also got this phrase, as far as I know. So that's like in my opinion, but also acknowledging that you don't have all the answers. As far as I know. Okay, and you see, again, the intonation is important. As far as I know. As far as I know. So it goes up on the I, as far as I know. Um, perhaps as the technology develops, it will become more common and be used in more use cases. So um, in more uses, basically, that's what that means. Do you think it's likely that in the future people will be able to alter the genetic makeup of their children? I would hate to get asked a question like this in the part in part three of the speaking test, but who knows, you might get asked a question like this. So just prepare now before you go into your real IELTS test. The next word is phase, a stage in a process or development. We can use it in the speaking test and the writing test and the pronunciation is phase. Many adolescents go through a rebellious phase. Here are some collocations. Again, pause the video if you want to go through them or just download the PDF below this lesson. Did you ever go through a rebellious phase during your adolescence? Not really, no. I guess I did things that could have been considered rebellious, such as skateboarding and staying in the city centre until late. However, my parents were rather lenient, and so I was never really breaking any rules. I had a lot of freedom as a teenager. Okay, again, I've got that short answer and then a longer response. Not really, no. And then I elaborate. I guess I did things that could have been considered. So that could have been considered. This is the passive form that could have been considered by other people as rebellious. So passive is very useful. Maybe not so much for the speaking test, but certainly for the writing test. Now we've got this phrase or this word lenient. Lenient is kind of the opposite of strict. If you have lenient parents, it means that maybe there's not so many rules or if you break a rule, it's not too much of a problem. They're very lenient, they're very relaxed about the rules. A bit like my parents. What are some different phases that children go through as they mature? Okay, you can practice that in your own time. We're gonna continue with the next word, which is adoption. So you can see these two parents have adopted a child. 
The act of taking another person's child legally into your family. We can use this in the speaking test and in the writing test. Pronunciation, adoption, adoption. Okay, so the stress is on the second syllable, adoption. Adoption is becoming more common in certain countries. Now we can say put up for adoption. It's a very good collocation. We've also got a verb form, to adopt. Is adoption common in your country? Yes, I'd say so. To be honest, I have no idea about the official statistics or how they compare to other countries. But anecdotally, I know a lot of people that were adopted or have adopted kids of their own. Okay, yes, I'd say so. Look, again, the short response and then the longer elaboration. So yes, I think so. And now I'm going to elaborate on why I think so. I've got the phrase, to be honest, very good. And then I have no idea about the official statistics. So this is a great phrase that you can use. Um, I have no idea about the official statistics, but anecdotally, anecdotally, so that means um, from my experience or from what I've heard from other people, um, this is what people say, but anecdotally. Um, and then you can say what you believe. Okay, what kind of difficulties does adoption address? A very tricky part three question. The next is nuclear family, a social unit of two parents with their children. We can use it in the speaking and writing test. Pronunciation, nuclear, nuclear family, nuclear. With the divorce rate increasing, the traditional nuclear family is becoming much less common. Okay. Do many of your friends come from nuclear families? You know, not that many. I know it's the typical family dynamic that is expected, but it certainly seems the case that more and more parents are separating. I think, uh, if I think about my immediate friendship circle, I'd say the majority of their parents have separated or remarried. Okay. You know, not that many. You know, so you know is a very colloquial term, but we can use it in the speaking test. You know, not that many. Um, I also talk about my immediate friendship circle. So remember earlier we talked about immediate friends, that's our closest friends. And we can also talk about a friendship circle, which means the friends around me. So if I talk about my immediate friendship circle, I'm talking about the closest friends around me. Immediate friendship circle. Okay, you could get asked a question like this. Why do you think traditional nuclear families are less common nowadays compared to the past? The next word is single parent family. A family that includes either a mother or a father, but not both. We can use it in the speaking and the writing test and the pronunciation is single family. Single family. It can be tricky for single parent families to juggle raising the children and earning a living. What can be difficult about being a single parent? Well, there's a few difficulties, many of which are made more difficult if there aren't other family members around to help with raising the children. Firstly, there's the financial difficulty. It can be very difficult to work and raise a family full time. That can put considerable strain on a family's finances. Secondly, it's just exhausting. Without other family members to help, many of the parenting responsibilities fall to just one person. Things like taking the child to school, picking them up, preparing meals, putting the children to bed, that sort of thing. Okay, well, there's a few difficulties, and then I've got firstly and secondly, so a good way to organise my answer. Well, there's a few difficulties. Firstly, da-da-da. Secondly, da-da-da. In addition, da-da-da. That's going to help us get a higher score for fluency and coherence. All right. Why do you think single parent families are more common these days? The next word is extended family. Families that include grandparents, aunts, uncles, etc. We can use it in the speaking test and the writing test. And the pronunciation is extended family. So it's almost like egg. Extended family. It's not X. It's not extended family, it's extended. It's like e.g. extended family. Young people who travel abroad will find it harder to stay in regular contact with extended family. Okay. 
In your, com in your country, is it common for people to live with their extended family in the same house? No, not, not at all really. I speak to a lot of students that live with their extended family under one roof. However, in the UK, it's not really that common. In fact, it's quite common that even the children will move out when they reach 18 and head off to uni or start work. Okay, no, not at all really. No, not at all really. Listen, no, not at all really. Not at all really. And then I go on to elaborate. I also talk about being under one roof. So there's one roof, the roof is the top part of your house. And so under one roof is a colloquial phrase or an idiomatic way of saying in one house. We all live under one roof. We all live in the same house. I've also got this head off, which means to leave, to go. Um, so if you head off to uni, it means when you leave home to go to university. What can be difficult about young people studying abroad? So if you get asked a question like this, um, then you can talk about how young people may miss their extended family and they might find it difficult to stay in contact with their extended family. Right, this has been a very comprehensive lesson. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of vocabulary in this lesson. So feel free to watch it once, watch it twice, watch it three times. And don't forget to download the PDF and go through the answers. Um, you'll also find a quiz connected to this lesson um, just below this, this video. Okay, best of luck with your studies and I'll see you in a future lesson. Bye then.